So the first thing I want to just start with is the first thing that we need to do when we come at this work is recognize that human beings were not designed to read. The brain does not learn just to read on its own. Reading must be explicitly taught. And when we are teaching a child to read, we are actually rewiring the brain and restructuring how the brain works. That's why it's hard. So I know you guys are familiar with the reading rope. We have talked about this um, before, and you guys have a lot of background knowledge on this, right? But that our goal is over here in a, well, a child that can read, that can do world, word recognition and comprehend the text. And this is where reading comprehension lands over here. But it requires these two skills, right? So the first, which is what we've been talking about, is the skill to lift words off the page, right? And that's what really what been our focus this year. But equally as important is language comprehension. And I want to point out it's language comprehension, not reading comprehension. So we need to build the language needed for reading. And then we put these together for reading comprehension, which falls over here. Okay. And so the science of reading is based on 30, 30 years of research, easily 30 years of research. And um, these are some of the ones that I'm pulling from today, but they're all excellent. Um, and basically the science of reading is a, a merging of research from many disciplines. So it's the cognitive scientists, you know, the ones that do brain scans, right? It's the educational researchers, it's the intervention researchers, it's so on. It's all these people coming together and they have all come together and basically say the same thing. We know how children learn how to read. So why does this matter? I actually, I love this image. It matters because if we look at all of the students that we teach, about 5% will learn to read and it will seem effortless. So I am one of these 5%, all right? I entered kindergarten reading, okay? Now, did I just learn it magically? No. I was lucky enough to have my neighbor who was four years old, and I'm still friends with her. She's like my adopted sister. She was, I think, four years older than me and was going to school, and she liked to play school. So she would lock me in the bedroom with her and make me play school with her. We even had our own little chalkboard and everything. And she was teaching me what her teachers were teaching her. So she taught me very explicitly how to read words. And um, so I entered kindergarten reading already because I had gone to school for two years prior <laughs> to kinder, getting all of that instruction with her. And when I got my doctorate, she took full credit for it. And I think she deserves it. So, but there's a small amount that will come in. It looks like easy as reading. Reading is easy, I'm sorry. And uh, about 35% will learn to read easily. So a total of 40% of our students will lead, learn to read easily. And when you look at your data at your school, I bet you have 40% that are just rocking it, right? They will probably read, it won't be that hard. And the method that you use matters, but it won't affect them as much, okay? But the structured literacy, which we talked about last time, the difference between structured and balanced, will accelerate it. So that's one of our questions right now is how do we accelerate? Well, that's one of the ways, right? 30 to 50% of our students need very explicit, systematic, and sequential phonics instruction and phonemic awareness. And then you're going to have about 10% that need more support. And though that's usually about how it lands within our schools. For these guys, though, down here, structured literacy is essential. So these guys, they probably would learn anyways. But these guys, if you don't, so we're talking 50 to 60% of our students, if we don't use it, probably will have issues with reading. So that's really why we're having this conversation. So how does the brain lift words off the page? As I said before, our brain is not wired to read, it's wired for speech. This is our first written language for the Phoenicians, and it is a sound-based system, just like English is. 
Um, Chinese is an exception. It is actually not, but most of the world languages are all phoneme or sound based. Okay. And because that's how our brains are wired, they're wired for speech. And so reading um, built from that. And so when we read, we actually use three parts of the brain. And basically this is the rewiring. We are creating these pathways and teaching the brain to work in a new way. So one part of the brain is seeing letter sequences, not whole words. The brain does not see whole words. It sees familiar letter sequences, okay? So we see C-A-T, and I'll get into this if we know what that is automatically, if it's been orthographically mapped, which I'll talk about in a minute, then we'll just say it's cat. If not, we have to put associate, when we're doing phonics, we then associate that symbol with the sound. So that is the point of the sound spelling card. So we see this C, we have a K, we put them together, we put K at cat, and that's the word, and then we have the part of the brain that gives us word meaning. So this is basically why reading is rooted in phonological processing and these phonemic awareness skills become so critical. And that sound symbol correspondence is so critical because that is actually how the brain reads. When we read, there's two different types of kind of word level reading that happen with us. And the first is phonics, which is what we've been talk about, talking about. So we have the skills to decode an unfamiliar word, right? So we see letters, we see a letter sequence, we associate those letters with the sound, right? Then we blend them, and then we are able to produce the word cat. And then we use the meaning, we know what a cat is, okay? The other aspect that we haven't talked that much about is actually something called orthographic mapping. And orthographic mapping is when we do that and the, the brain has done it enough times so that is automatic. And that is actually why we think we read by sight, but actually by sight words, but we actually don't. Because but when we orthographically mapped, the brain has memorized that letter sequence into a familiar pattern. And then it knows with automaticity that this word right here is reading. That word is orthographically mapped in your brain. So it goes really, really fast and with automaticity. And then it becomes a sight word. So as proficient readers, we have 50,000 or more orthographically mapped words in our brains, okay? But you are still never, the brain is never reading whole words. It's actually very quickly seeing C-A-T, says, I know C-A-T, that's cat, cat, and it's the word cat. And it does it really fast, so we aren't even aware of it. So let's see, let me give you an example. So I think you guys know I just came back from Hawaii a couple of days ago. And, you know, I'm always working even when I'm on vacation. And I started noticing a whole bunch of words that were not orthographically mapped in my brain. Words on the screen in these pictures are orthographically mapped for you. That means you read them with automaticity and you don't even have to think about it. Clean and freeway. Yep. <laughs> right? I mean, this is perfect. Like this is an example. So this, these two words right here are orthographically mapped. We just read them. We know what they are. There's no hesitation. However, as I'm driving around Oahu, I was like, what's that word? And I noticed my brain slowing down and attempting to decode. So basically I was going back and forth between these two things. So most words for me are orthographically mapped, but when something is not, I go back to this. And so this is what we're teaching children in phonics. Our goal is that they orthographically map and don't need to use this but it's still a skill that we have when we need to slow down and figure out an unfamiliar word. So both become super critical. All right, so basically this is what's happening. You have the three parts you know, of the brain working together and it's putting the three sounds to get this, the sequence of letters connected to the sound, makes the word bed and we connect it with meaning. 
And these three things are working together when we are reading. And that's basically what the brain does. And so that's why I was sharing with you the hear, see, say, right, right? So we got to, we have, it's all rooted in the phoneme and the ability to connect the phoneme with the, the symbol that's here, the phoneme graphing, we have to be able to connect them and then we have to blend them. And if we can't do that, we can't, we probably won't be able to read the word. Becomes the, why we do this phonemic awareness work as well as the sound symbol correspondence work with the sound spelling card. This is also why we do all the blending work to teach them what do you do when a word is unfamiliar? How do you look at that sequence, put those sequence together to make a word? And then encoding helps us go the other direction, but it also helps with that orthographic mapping. So the blending and the encoding help with the, uh, the say and the write, help us with the orthographic mapping. Uh, orthographically mapped words are precognitive, right? You can't help yourself but read them. So what color is this? Yellow. Blue. Uh, yeah, okay, what color is this? Red. It's red. But what do you read? Your brain reads yellow, right? So when you read these words, you, you can't help but read them because these words are orthographically mapped in your brain. You do it so automatic that you can't help it. So when I said, what's the color? Most of us will say blue and then you went, wait, it's yellow, right? Because you have to slow yourself down and pay attention to it. So this is an example of orthographically mapped words. So this is why it appears to us that we are reading words as whole words. Because as proficient readers, they're orthographically mapped, <laughs> right? But for children that don't have this orthographically mapped, they do not see the whole word. They, they have to do the individual sounds, right? The sequence of letters, blend them together to produce the word. The problem is, is that we're proficient readers. <laughs> so here's some more for you to practice to challenge your brain with. We can't help ourselves. Summarize, there's two things we're working on with our students, right? The decoding skills, so that is what do you do when you identify, you come across an unfamiliar word? How can I under, identify that word, right? They need the skills to do that. But the other half of what we need to develop with them is permanent word storage. And that is helping them orthographically map so that they have automatic word recognition. The thing is, is both of these, and we need both, like with those pictures from Hawaii, you had to go from here to here. You had to do both driven by our phonological skills, our phonemic skills, and our sound spelling correspondence. And that's why I've been emphasizing those skills with you, because if we don't have those, it's not possible for them to do these two things and then consequently lift words off the page.